Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. So this is George the Antique Nomad, and I'm at Treasure Hunt. This is in Powder Springs, Georgia. And these are my new friends, Thrift Kitten and her fiance. And they invited me here. They found some stuff they liked of mine. And I said I'd drop it off. And they are dealers here. And I'm going to get to go into my first mall since the shutdown. So thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So walking in the door, one of the first things that I see is a case full of razors and pocket knives. I have a lot of call for these. They have military ones. You can see this one here is marked US. That one is a Keen Cutter. That's a great name. You can't really see the logo on that one, but Keen Cutter is very desirable. Case is another one. This hunting knife in the middle here with the long bone handle is a case. Those are pretty desirable as well. That one is Gainesville Fire Department. It's priced at $35. Because it has colored enameling, without the color they're usually in the 25 to 30 range, but enameling and size both make it better. I also see something I think I have to have in a spot down here. This is a Pennsylvania Railroad hat badge. I'm gonna have them take that out for me. One thing we don't see collections of very often anymore are fountain pens because so many are in collections already. They have a nice selection here in the 20 to 30 dollar range which is about typical for the ordinary fountain pens. Sometimes you'll want to look at them to see if the pieces are made of gold. There are certain ones that have gold nibs and certain ones that have gold attachments, caps, and that sort of thing. So you'll want to look for carat weight marks on those. Also interesting in the back, it's just the lid, but it says Parker Pen's Lucky Curve sell because they excel. That is the top of a pen case from right around 1930. They also have a case full of Vaseline glass, as they call it, or uranium glass, as a lot of people call it now. The top two are Fenton, and they are satin glass from the 1960s and 70s. Then we get down to the next level, and these are depression glass pieces. And I always tell people sometimes they fluoresce and sometimes they don't. I know we've got a little glare here, but let's see if we can get in on it. There we go. Notice how the bowl just has a little bit of a green tinge, but then the soda glass has more. And on this shelf here, some of them glow more brightly than others. That's because in the Depression era, these were pressed and molded pieces. So unlike the Victorian pieces or the later Fenton pieces that were deliberately done, this really had more just to do with the fact that they wanted to brighten up the color of green. So there's varying amounts of the uranium oxide in them that make the glow. I like what this dealer has done. They've actually put the jewelry out where you can get to it. Now, I know that some places don't have the right security, but these folks, this is up near the front, and they greet you and you can tell that there's somebody paying attention and as a dealer I find that shows when I'm there to pay attention it's much better to have the jewelry out where people can pick it up and look at it. I see some interesting textured stones here these are going to be 1960s. People tend to like pins with textured stones in it just because it has a richer and deeper look. Now of course signed jewelry pieces are the most popular amongst costume jewelry, especially now. It used to be that people bought it more for the look, now they seem to buy it more for signatures. But there are some rules to go by if you're a reseller. Round shapes are typically harder to sell. Clear and white are typically harder to sell. Colors are good as long as it's a single color or a closely related family of colors. The reason being that a woman wants something that accessorizes a particular outfit and if there's too many colors even though I personally like them being a guy I'm just looking at oh that's cool looking they want something that goes with the outfit and if it has too many colors in it then it doesn't go with everything. Now this is a toy dealer who spans a few generations and that's a pretty smart thing. There was a time when I would look at a space like this and say well there's a bunch of plastic who wants plastic toys well that was before 
a new generation who were born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s started wanting things from their childhood. And all of a sudden you have stuff like Kiss dolls and Transformers and all sorts of action figures that are desirable because they're familiar to people. This up here is a late 60s piece, the Shark. This actually had its own controller and you can make it run around and do a bunch of different stuff. It's by a company called Remco and it was referred to as a tether car because it actually had a way that you could tether it and roll it around. And it had a bunch of presets where you can make it go in circles, you can make it go in different patterns. And this is all done mechanically. This is before you had computer chips to do those sort of things. The Sam truck is by Marx, M-A-R-X. They were probably the biggest metal toy maker in America. You see the cab is plastic and the back is metal. That's going to make it late 50s. By the 1960s, there were concerns about metal toys with the tabs, that they were dangerous for children because they hooked on things, and that's pretty much what put Marks out of business. Now, if you were afraid of that before that time, you got your child a rubber car, and Auburn was the big maker of rubber car toys. There was also Sun Rubber, but this one has Auburn marked very clearly on it. This race car is going to be probably 1950s or early 60s, looking at the color of the wheels. Then we're going to pull back, and of course one of the things that we have interest in now is Star Wars. And Darth Vader here, well, he was a great thing to hold all your other action figures. And he's only $15. Speaking of plastic toys from the 70s, we've got G.I. Joe here, the G.I. Joe Jeep gun mount. It still has its spring in it. That's important. People want these toys to work if they're going to pay top dollar. This one's priced about $175 with the trailer and the gun, and that seems to be about what retail is on these. Now when I was really little, Hot Wheels were a pretty new thing. Mattel brought them out just before the end of the 1960s, and in the first generation they had red line wheels. These are actually the originals. They'd be in this blister pack and they would have a little metal so you could wear this little metal pin back that showed the car you bought. The race cars are the most desirable. These are priced in the $140 range and that is not unreasonable for mint in the package. There's been lots of revivals of these so make sure that what you're getting is really old but indeed Hot Wheels are a hot collectible. Board games are collectible now too especially if they have to do with pop culture or television shows of a particular era. And this fellow, who is Retroville Toys and Collectibles, has a pretty neat supply. Here's I Spy, which featured Bill Cosby, and of course people who are infamous add value to things, so that one's only $20. I think the fact that Bill Cosby's on it might make it worth money. Here's a sort of interpretation of Vanna White. She actually looks better than that in real life, and still looks pretty much the same. And then Gnip Gnop, I remember this was a fun game because you would shoot little plastic balls through hoops at each other and it made lots of noise and you'd get very excited and annoy your parents and then they'd make you take it outside. There is a fish in the middle here I want to show you because it has a Murano label that you'll see sometimes and it's worn in a way that you might not be able to read. See the gondolier? If the rest of the lettering was there, it would say Made in Murano, and I believe it would say Arte Murano or one of the other glass companies. So if you see that logo with the gondolier, you can be resting assured that it is Murano. Give you a shot down the aisle here. Oh, here's somebody, speaking of people who are infamous. We have a Pee Wee Herman doll. Boy, they have a lot of interesting toys here. Here's the little peewee. I think there was a bigger one as well that you would pull the chain and he would say lots of different funny things. And fortunately, in this case, the pants are up. This place really does have a good selection of more recent vintage collectibles, meaning since the 60s or 70s that people are really interested in now. This is Time Machine Music. And they've got a bunch of albums that are familiar to me because I'm old enough to remember some of these. Thunderball with the James Bond graphics on it. They've got 15 on it. It has a lot to do with the graphics. They've got a bunch of old Kiss albums. That was such a phenomenal band in its time. At least they certainly were a phenomenon. Nobody had seen anything like that. People dressing in 
costume where everybody in the band was dressed and they did these huge stadium shows where they'd have 40 or 50,000 people and that was pretty unheard of until they came along. We certainly talk about Pyrex a lot these days, but I wanted to show this pattern because this was actually made to go along with Falls Graph dishes. This would be a match for the Yorktown and Villager patterns, at least in a vague sense. And that was deliberate. A lot of companies, especially in the 1980s, started to work together to create entire kitchenware lines where everything matched. These are collectible, of course, as all Pyrex is, and they're interesting in that they look a lot more like stoneware, which was the point. I did an Instagram post yesterday and was really surprised by the response. I showed some Victorian parlor furniture that I had sold at an estate sale in Florida and mentioned that younger people seem to be getting interested in this again, and I got 90 responses, which is about double my usual of a lot of people, including younger people, saying, yes, indeed, I am sick of boxy, and I want something that has some style, and yes, I like Victorian furniture, so we may see a turnaround in brown furniture. These are nice oak pieces. The marble top there, they have it disassembled, but that little washstand is going to be from the 1880s, and this nice oak sideboard, also American. Very nice carved detailing in the bow knots. It's got the pith rays, or tiger oak some people call it you can see the lines that's because oak trees were allowed to grow older then and so you'd get those lines in the grain you really don't see that anymore because we cut all those old oak trees down to well make houses and furniture like this four hundred dollars is the price on this and look at those great lion headed handles with more people suddenly working at home, a lot of people who live in small spaces are trying to figure out what they're going to do for a desk. This would only hold a laptop, but this is a 1930s style where you see a china cabinet with a secretary desk in the middle. These are generally English pieces. They're generally not terribly expensive, usually in the two to three hundred dollar range. And if you're just using a laptop, it's a great place to have a spot to do your work a little bit of storage for essentials, and it's some place other than your lap to put it. I find personally that because I'm on the computer so much these days, it starts to get really hot and uncomfortable even if you have a pad, so it's nice to actually have a real desk to sit at sometimes. And this one also has display for your collections. With so many airlines of the legacy years having gone out of business, there is a collector market for vintage airline memorabilia now, and this is Eastern Airlines. They were founded by Eddie Rickenbacker, who was a World War I ace, and they were in business until about 1990. And when they went out of business, since we're in the Atlanta area, I remember that there were warehouse sales where they just got rid of all the stuff that was left. This is $10. These usually sell for about 20. I may have to pick that one up. We do see a lot of our older dealers retiring. There's a lot of antique dealers who do this into their 80s and 90s, and at a certain point, well, I guess that maybe it's time to take a few years off and do some other things with the rest of your life. I can't imagine that, but maybe we get there someday. So I always look in spaces like this where they're having big discounts to see if there's anything because at 70% off, the chances of finding something for resale are pretty good. I notice they have several globes and the prices are good. I'll have to look at them to get a better idea of their eras. I really only like the ones that are 1960s and earlier, and you basically have to look at what countries are called what in order to determine the age on these things. There's a pair of Victorian shoes that are cute here. I like the two-toning. The tips are a little bit worn. She apparently kicked her husband a few too many times. But these with the two-toning would have been right at the end of the Victorian era when the Gibson girls start wearing all white. So you have the white uppers and then the dark down on the bottom because you're still probably going through mud and dirt and probably not paved streets back then, so you didn't want to get them soiled. And here's my first definite find of the day. This is out of the 70% off booth, and it's an old horn, and it makes a really good noise, and that's what I like. It was $29 and now it's 70% off, so I've got to take that. One way to tell old from new, by the way, is to look at the base. If you see a number impressed like this, you can tell from the script that that's older. You can also look at the joinery. 
and make sure that the gauge of the metal seems to be older and that the tarnish is appropriate and even like it should be, not faked. Here's another good G.I. Joe collectible, the G.I. Joe Headquarters. This is priced at $40, and it's a playset that would have come out about 1970. You've got the sliding door. It looks like it's got a lot of parts. This is something I'm going to need to look into because I've only had a few G.I. Joe pieces, and they've sold very well for good money. Some of this early stuff is pretty hard to find in good shape because kids played with it, and G.I. Joe came out in the mid-60s. And so, really... The notion that you're going to find a lot of stuff from that era when it was brand new and people weren't thinking this will be collectible someday, pretty hard to imagine. Now this is a little bit later, Joe. I would say this is 70s because they let him have a beard and a mustache in the 70s because that was the style then. Here's some nice turn of the century furniture like we're used to seeing in the Midwest more than in the South. On the left you have an oak cabinet. From right about 1900 to 1910 where you have the carved top. One thing about this era of furniture is unlike the Victorian where a lot of the gingerbreading was actually plaster, these American pieces that were a little simpler tended to be all wooden because they really were about the quality. And that's why they're still around today. For someone with a small kitchen that needs extra space, this is a nice thing to have. It's priced at $340, which is pretty reasonable. Next to it we have a Kitchen Queen, and this one is priced at about $4.75. It's got that nice minty green edge on that enameled ivory top, and that's going to tell us probably in the 1930s, which is about the end of the Kitchen Queen. After that, people start to have built-in cabinetry. But lots of people have houses that don't have enough of that, even today, so they still have a home. And then there's this oak piece. I had this exact same piece of furniture by the Larkin Company. Larkin was a soap company out of Buffalo. They started distributing furniture as part of their line and it ended up being more popular than the soap. So they ended up being largely a furniture company. This is a drop front secretary with a little display top. So this, you could easily get some skeleton key to make it open easier so you didn't have to pull on that. But when you open it up, the chains hold it in place. You have a desk surface and lots of nice fittings to sort your bills and your office supplies. Again, this is an option for people who are working at home now. The other thing that's neat about it is the price. It is priced at $250. That's about what I got for mine. These used to sell for double that. So if you like this kind of furniture, this is a good time to be buying because it's been out of style, but I get the feeling that's about to change as people during stressful times tend to go back to more tradition. For those of you who just don't believe that anyone would want anything plastic, well, I'm sorry to tell you, but Tupperware is back. Look at this booth. It is an entire booth full of it. My friend who I share space with at one of the Florida shows brought about this much to a show, and she sold 70% of it at that show. Now, you do want to be careful if you're worried about things like BPA. You definitely need to check your dates because some of the older pieces do contain that. If you're not concerned about that, or if you're wrapping the things you're putting in it anyway, then that might not be such an issue for you. Prices are good. The veggie keepers here are 6 to $10. They actually cost more than that new. Then next to it, we have Falls Graf Yorktown and a little bit of villager. And you can see that while the pattern is not exactly the same as that Pyrex that I showed you, it's definitely inspired by a very similar type of sponge printing. You can see that they actually printed this on with the old blue slip. You can see the sponging effect in the glaze. I get a kick out of seeing these again. When I worked at Arby's in the 1980s, my first job, it was the BC glasses that brought a lot of people in. And here's a whole set of them. These were made, I believe, again, by Anchor Hawking, but I don't think that they're marked in any way. They did these nice little pinch sides on them so they're easy to hold. Whoops, let's not break it. And BC was a very popular comic at that time. And you have all those characters on there. They were a lot of fun, and we had a lot of people come back and assemble sets, so I know there's more of these out there. This particular set with the four glasses and the pitcher is priced at $40. Now you know I'm going to look at a space that has signs, and this has a bunch. 
they're in the more dilapidated condition in general, but we also know they're original that way. We've got the Clico Club above here. That's going to be from about the 1940s, and the Eskimo Child was their logo. To the right, we have Diet Right Cola, the first Diet Cola that existed. Then we have this Lasser's Beverage sign, and you'll notice this shiny metallic. It's actually similar to screen printing, but this has texture. This was raised. And looking at the style, this is definitely Art Deco. You see the streamlining here, the little arrows here. This is going to be 1930s. It was an inexpensive way at the time to make signage. It's printed on cardboard. Late 30s, early 40s, especially during the war, you're not using metal for signs. And that one's priced at 99. This dealer has a nice old leather golf club caddy and the golf clubs are in it, it's priced at 150. Most people won't use the old golf clubs because the way that they make the ball fly, we've become more experienced and have other things that do the job better. But they're neat looking. Those all appear to be metal shafts. But if you find ones with a wooden shaft, the clubs themselves are worth 15 to $30 individually. Here's a good example of where thinking you know something can get you in trouble. I was all excited seeing the G-Men whistle from the 1950s because G-Man was a popular show and I like things that are pop culture related. It's shaped like a gun, it's a toy whistle, it's eight dollars. I thought that's terrific. Of course the Japanese did lots of knockoffs, they didn't bother to get permission. So this is not from the show it's supposed to make you think it is and it just about worked on me. So they were very clever but I didn't fall for it. Now, I actually remember Billy Whiskers from childhood because they reproduced these books in the 1970s. They were very popular in the 19-teens. They were by Francis Trigo Montgomery, and they were a story of a goat. And boy, he gets around. He stowed away. He ends up in a circus in one book. They made a lot of Billy Whiskers and Billy Whiskers Jr. items around that time. Mainly books, but you see there's a game here, too. The graphics are just great, and he's fun because he's a, just as obnoxious as you would think a goat would be. And the price of these is not that expensive. This was published in 1906. This piece here, the game box, is $8. The books are in the 5 to 10 range. Really cute graphics, fun to put on a shelf, and actually they're good stories. Vintage children's books really run the gamut. You see a lot of them that are priced in the 3 to $5 range, but then certain even golden books from the 50s, especially if they're Disney related, can be worth quite a lot of money. Now Thrift Kitten, who I introduced you to, and her fiance have this space. And I saw things right away that I want to buy in this space. So I'm going to have some fun here. I will show you one particular item that caught my eye immediately that I've just got to have. This is the sign that says, Illegitimi non carborundum. This expression shows up in The Handmaid's Tale. It also was one of Barry Goldwater's unofficial slogans when he was running for president, because in effect in Latin it essentially means don't let the bastards get you down. Down on the bottom here we have one of these fancy French-looking rotary phones. This one's going to be from about the 1970s. You can tell because of the sort of plastic cameo face in the middle. People really like these and with a lot of people getting landlines again they like something fancy a lot of times because they're not using it all that much so it might as well look cool. You can see on the bottom that this was made in Korea. We see a lot of brass items from Korea particularly in the late 70s and early 80s and that's when this should date. They have this priced about ten dollars below retail at 35 and I have to say I'd be tempted if I didn't already have one. Something else I really like in Thrift Kitten Space is she's got candlestick holders and she's got colorful ones and she has tall ones. We really see a lot of short ones and I have a friend who loves candles and she says I have the hardest time finding tall ones. We see low ones like on the bottom shelf. Those are mainly depression glass from the 30s but here we've got some taller ones. Also depression era and even into the 50s and 60s some of these. Great colors, good sizes. Actually a lot of them seem to be in the six dollar range so it's a good price for somebody. I think they're really neat. I took these out of their display but I don't think they'll mind. I wanted to show them. They're really beautiful. They're very heavy. They're Pompeian bronze. Similar to the Armor Bronze Company. These have a 1925 date on them. Bronze bookends were very popular, metal bookends of all sorts that are figural from the 1920s. They have a nice mark on them so you know right where they came from. 
and that the name of the scene is Adoration, and aren't they adoring and adorable? Now there's a little bit of wear on the surfaces from being cleaned very aggressively by some former owner, but it doesn't seem that there's a lot of wear in the coloration. I could not find any evidence of this pair having sold recently, but the asking prices are all double what they're wanting for these, so I think these are a good value at 65 One other thing I see that I like are the Moon and Stars canister set. It's nice that they have all four sizes. Usually you see one of them missing. And at $65, I've seen sales that are as much as double that. It's a bell that's advertising Schlitz beer, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. That's a very strange advertising piece for them, and at $4 I've got to have that. I had to show the Rusty Snail booth because I like booths a lot that are thematic and where it really looks like you're stepping into a room, and they definitely have the Rustic Lodge look down. And we're going to walk in, you're going to see they have lots of mounts, whether they be large fish, or antelope, or deer. This just looks like a really homey place that you could spend some time. And it definitely looks like grandfather's house, come to think of it. Here's a dinnerware set that we haven't seen often lately. We used to see this a lot more. You'll notice the shape of the cups and handles if you're familiar with Curry or an Ives dinnerware by Royal China. They also did other patterns on this blank old curiosity shop that looks like Dickens ware, but this particular one is called Bucks County. It's a very bright, happy yellow, and these came out in the 1950s when people were doing color-coordinated kitchens, and yellow was a popular color for kitchens then because it was bright and cheerful. This is an entire set for $45, which is quite inexpensive, considering it's got all the plates and completer pieces. I am looking to see if there's any marks on these. A lot of times Royal China didn't mark this stuff until later years. But here we go, when you do find the mark, it's going to look like this. Bucks County by Royal Sebring, Ohio. Underglaze. Underglaze means the transfer pattern is under a glaze, so it's not going to wear out, which means you can dishwash it and microwave it. One thing I really enjoy are these round garden shelves. These were very popular in the 40s and 50s. These are two quarter rounds that are matched together, and they tear down like this. And every time I've seen one in a space, it hasn't been for sale because dealers realize that it's great for selling all this happy pastel pottery from the 1940s and 50s. We've got McCoy there. We've got Royal Copley. It looks like a couple of pieces of hull. Very fun display. And the prices are pretty good. The pink swan base by McCoy there is $22.50, which is a very fair price. Metal shelves, if they were for sale, would probably be $150 to $250 because, again, nobody wants to give those up. This head vase is actually one of the earliest ones when they were still made in America in the early 50s. They definitely are heavier and thicker than the Japanese ones that were made later, as you can see. Now, by way of comparison, here is the left in China, late 1950s, early 1960s head vase, which would have replaced the one on the left. They like to put the jewels on them, and that does make them more desirable. Look how much thinner the wear is. The Japanese had to make it thin so that it would be inexpensive to ship, otherwise they couldn't have competed. But they did very well, and most of our American companies left the market. This one has the Lepton's China mark from Japan. It also has the mark of Christine's, which apparently was a place in Erie, Pennsylvania, where this was purchased. I always enjoy seeing the old store stamps on things because it gives you an idea where things have traveled from. And since I travel a lot, it's fun to see that merchandise travels a lot. The other thing on the head bases is you'll notice the difference in prices. In this case, the Japanese is more expensive. Since it's spring, and since a lot of us are staying close to home a lot, a nice wicker settee so we can get out and enjoy the porch and get some air is a nice idea. This one's priced really reasonably. It's painted in the dark green, which was a popular thing to do in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Good shape, good condition. It's only $55. I have to say I'm really tempted to get that but I've got to take stock of what I have in furniture first. Down here, this is a very good buy for a collector. This is the McCoy Triple Lily vase from the 1930s and 40s. This one's priced at 27. I've seen these sell as much as 45 to 50. Unfortunately, in the current situation, we have to look at our buying a little differently. $27 minus a dealer discount would make that absolutely buyable if I had a show to take it to. But until my antique mall space is open again, 
or I go to a show, I can't really pay that for it because, well, it's a great deal. If I put it online and ship it, it'll cost $15 to $20 to ship, and you basically aren't making any money. So we're looking forward to having other venues in the antique business because it will open up more possibilities to buy and sell for everybody. Here's another fine looking cabinet from the 1880s or 90s. The reason I say that era, it's made of American walnut, it appears, but it has spoon carving. Let's take a look at what spoon carving means. Essentially, they would use a tool that was like a little sharpened spoon looking thing and they would dig in these designs. That's something we refer to as intaglio, where the design is below the surface of the item, as opposed to embossing, where you stamp it or mold it so that it sticks up above the surface. That is the hallmark of Eastlake design in American Eastlake. Eastlake actually started in England in the 1870s and was a reaction against Victorian gingerbreading, but by the time it came to America, it was actually used as an excuse for more decoration. But I've always liked the spoon carving personally. Nostalgia is something in every era, and in the 1950s, nostalgia was for the 1890s, because a lot of people's grandparents would have been born in the 1890s back then, or have even lived through it. And so, these are by Van Anchor Hawking. This is the gay 90s set, and you see the gas buggy, the horse car, the Hanson, a bicycle for two. Bicycles were a big thing back then. So this is 1950s nostalgia. For the gay 90s, as they were called, it's funny because the gay 90s were probably a lot of fun when it got close to the turn of the century, but the middle of the decade was a terrible depression. So it's funny how we think of things differently in retrospect. Hopefully we'll feel that way about this time we're going through now. This is a 1930s Czechoslovakian wall pocket in the shape of a bird. It's priced at $20. They can sell for more than that. It's very pretty in my opinion. I like all the different colors and you see a lot of parrots, different types of birds from that era. They oftentimes will have a mark on the back that says made in Czechoslovakia. It's usually a little round ink stamp and though lo and behold there it is. I seem to be on a desk kick today but I think it's because I've been trying to work in a small desk environment myself lately. This is a nice little oak secretary desk, a very plain style. This would be 1910s, possibly even handmade. Again, it's got the wide rays, the pith rays, or tiger oak, as it's called by a lot of folks. And when you drop it open, again, you've got a nice surface big enough for a laptop computer and a place to store all your flash drives and little junk. And this piece is priced at $150, so it's a pretty good value for the money. And just so you can see that we're all wearing our masks like we're supposed to. Hello. Another piece of American Eastlake is this mantle surround. And again, we're going to see spoon carving to the left and the right of the mirror. This one's been nicely refinished. It looks like it's fur, which would have been a less expensive material, but it's got a very distinctive grain that people like in older homes. So even in newer homes, if people want a touch of old, they will sometimes build these in, even with a fake fireplace or a gas fireplace, just for the look. Here's a nice collection of Fire King Jadeite in the Jane Ray pattern. Jane Ray is when you have these very simple rays on the side. I think they called it Jane Ray because they had a floral pattern called Alice, so there was a period where they were naming things after women. These would have come out in the late 40s. They were very popular in this country and very popular in Japan, and there's a lot of Japanese collectors because a lot of this was sent over during the occupation and they tend to really like this jade color, so that interest has lasted. That's part of the reason that jade has become so expensive between the Japanese and Martha Stewart. Everybody discovered it about the same time. I also have always liked this piece. This is the large crisscross 1930s depression glass refrigerator jar obviously called crisscross for the design. Great deep color. Let's see what they have on this for a price. Yeah, 110. It's Hazel Atlas. It is a hard one to find. I like this wicker stand very flower pop, 1970s. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be for sale. A lot of times neat stuff that is fixtures in dealer spaces are not for sale. One thing that is for sale that I want to point out, though, is a piece of Blanco we don't see very often. This is a late 80s piece. You can see the square label, which was their 1980s and 90s mark, Blanco handmade. 
This is called the pineapple line for obvious reasons. You'll see it in a more pineapple-y color, but they did make it in other colors as well. They have this priced at 95. Blinko is very popular now. It's a hard piece to find. And one final grouping of East Lake furniture with the spoon carving. Here's a little swing mirror dresser. It's a dresser if it has a mirror. This one's nice because it's got the little drawers on top for gloves and little pieces of jewelry and such, and then the three drawers below. It's priced at $2.95, as is the headboard and footboard. Well, it was really fun to be back in the saddle again. I'm glad I got to see this place, and I really want to thank Thrift Kitten and her fiance for inviting me and meeting me here so that I could film. The owner was very kind and they seem like very nice people. There are fun things in the store and I will definitely come back to Powder Springs, Georgia. So on the road for more, this is George the Antique Nomad. I'll come back to you every week or more on YouTube and daily posts on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And boy, it's about time I do a Periscope, so I need to show up back there too. Anyhow, great to see you all. Whoa, a little windy. <laughs> okay, bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!